I'm Steve from This Work With Cars, and I'm about to go and look at a pretty neat barn find. Driving my Austin Healy 100. Okay, it's been a couple days and here they are. I got them all moved back to my shop. I knew that I wanted them, so I actually I haven't taken a look at them yet. I just loaded them up and shipped them back here. It's pretty neat to have found six bug eyes all parked in a row. These cars have been sitting for approximately 30 years without moving. I think what we should do is number these cars, that way we can keep track of them. So I'll just call this one number one. Two, three, this will be number four, five, and six. One neat thing is you can see I have hard tops on four of these cars. I believe these three are actual factory BMC hard tops. Let's give each car a look over and then decide what we can do with these today. Car number four, looks pretty complete inside. Looks like all it's missing is the radiator cap, one heater hose there from the heater control valve and a battery. Car number three and four also had the front bumpers on it. This one has a soft top on it. So that's good, we know that still fits. Interior on this one is black. And again, someone's added black carpeting to it. There's the backs of cars three and four. Pretty complete, both have the Sprite logos on the back. It looks like all of these cars are pretty much in the same shape except for car number five down there that does not have an engine in it. I'm Steve and this is This Week With Cars. Barn Sprites number one and two are now on the road and drivable. This one is Barn Sprite number four. This is the next one I'm going to tackle. Just like Barn Sprite number two, this car will also be for sale when I am done with it. So let's take a look around it and decide what to do first. I've probably done a video showing what the inside of this car looked like when I got it. Let's take a look at what we have in here now. Here's the horn button here on the floor. So that'll go in the center of the steering wheel there. Looks like this car had some sort of weird stereo uh, speaker here sitting in the center console. We won't need this. This is just complete junk. The seats do appear to be in pretty good condition. They'll probably clean up just fine. And this car has carpet. And I think the carpet looks like it'll probably clean up just fine too. You can see the side curtains over there. Again, just like the previous Sprite, we are missing our temp and oil gauge. Someone has added a cigarette lighter, and this is a vintage Motorola radio. The dealer could have installed this when it was new. Down here we have some sort of ashtray. Is it magnetic? Yeah, it's magnetic, but it's probably not useful for anything today. And I have a couple of battery cables. That's it. So get the bonnet open and take a look inside there. Under the bonnet, it looks mostly intact. You can see the master cylinder there. The air cleaners are still on the carb. We are missing a radiator cap. Generators there. Looks like the tack is even hooked up. It has the gear drive to change the ratio from the ratio of the belt off of the water pump to match up with the tachometer. Regulator and fuse box are in place on this car. So we're missing a battery and it looks like possibly one of the battery cables. 
And we're also missing the little hose that goes from the heater valve to the heater. But beyond that, I don't see anything missing other than that at first glance. Obviously, little things like the air duct vent that goes here, you know, little things like that, but not anything that we need to get this running. So I'm gonna grab a battery, put that in, and also take the battery cable and hook that up as well. There's paint filling the hole where the battery cable would mount. So I'm gonna clean it up with my thread chaser here. It's kind of like a tap, but it's not as aggressive. You can use these to clean up holes. I use this all the time. Since I replaced the battery cable on this side, you can see there was two wires that were connected to it. So I'm gonna have to pull this apart, get these two wires out. And obviously this wire here going through the rust hole in the firewall is not correct. So I'll pull that back inside the car, figure out if I need to hook it up at all. And if not, I'll just leave it in there and I'll get this one, which does need to be hooked up, uh, connected uh, with a ring terminal up to the battery. Here inside the car, that wire that goes through the rusted spot where the battery acid had worn away on the firewall there does go to the back of the ignition switch. So I probably do need to put a ring terminal on and connect that wire up to the battery as well. I have both of my ring terminals on now. This is the one that goes through the rust hole and that's connected to the ignition switch. And this one is the original wiring that would be connected to the battery here. Let's check these wires, see if either of them are safe to connect. You probably can't hear or see this on camera, but this one feels like there's a little bit of current going through it when I touch it. This is the original wiring one. If I grab the one that goes through the firewall, that we know it goes to the ignition switch. Now if you can hear that, it's also a little bit of current that's going through when I touch that one to the battery as well. So I'll have to be mindful not to leave these connected uh, when the car is sitting, otherwise the battery will be drained. For now, I'm only going to connect the wire that goes to the ignition switch. Hopefully that will power up everything that we need to get the car running. I've turned off the lights now and maybe we can see the spark better. You can see that spark coming off of that wire when I'm touching it there. Let's try the other one. Yeah. You can see this one is sparking as well. I just looked down here and I pulled on the cable. I don't know if I can get to that or not, but that cable right there goes to the starter and it's actually disconnected from the back of the starter. In fact, it looks like the starter it's not bolted up to the engine either. So I'm just gonna pull that out so that I can bench test it before I bolt it in. I don't wanna bolt it in if it is not a good starter. I have the starter out of the car now. Let's connect a battery up to it and see if it runs. I don't need to worry about whether I'm using a positive ground like I am here or a negative ground. The starter will spin the same either way. I'll just touch my other clamp to the post back here and we'll see if it runs. Seems to run pretty good. I'll take this back over to the car and get it mounted in. The starter is installed and connected, but before I start cranking the engine over, I'm going to need to block off this oil line. Since there is no oil pressure gauge, I'm just going to screw a screw into this hose to block it so that this isn't spraying oil everywhere while I'm cranking the engine. Now let's pull the starter cable, see if the engine turns over. Turns over really well, actually. Now we need to check and see if we have any spark. I doubt that the points work, so I'm just going to take the distributor cap off now and check for spark there. Right here is the points. And if I have the ignition on and crank the engine over, if they're working, we should see them sparking. You can see how white they are right now. See how white those points are right now? That's all corrosion. 
I'm not even going to bother cranking the engine over before I clean these up. So I'm gonna go grab my points file, get these cleaned up, and then we'll test for spark. Okay, I have the points cleaned up with my file. I'm going to turn off the light and then crank the engine over. We'll see if it's sparking now. Okay, we can see the points that are working well now. Let's just take a quick look at the rotor and cap before I put it back together. There's a little bit of dirt and corrosion on here. And on the cap, you can see the corrosion on the pins. For now, I'm just going to clean these up and then put it back together. Down here is the fuel pump. It's driven off of the engine. And this pipe right here, this supplies the fuel up to the, both of the carburetors. I want to put an inline fuel uh, filter in line here. So I'm going to cut this pipe off here and here so that I can put a length of hose and a fuel filter there. It will also make it easier for testing the carburetors, filling them up with fuel, and testing if the pump works or not. So that we can start the engine, I'm just going to use my little drip tank of fuel here. It does have a valve on it so I can shut it off. I have the two ends cut off now. I'm going to hook up my fuel IV drip to this end so that we can put fuel in the carburetors. I have a little valve hooked up to it here. So let's turn on the fuel, see if the float bowls fill up. Okay, we can see this carb is starting to leak now. This fuel bowl is filling up. The gaskets on these carbs will have shrunk over time from getting dried out and not having any fuel near them. Let's crank it over and see what happens. Wants to run. Come over here where I can give it some throttle. This one started quite easily. Doesn't want to idle quite yet. Let's start this up one more time. Look at that, it's actually idling on its own now. You can see all the stuff that came out of the exhaust. Looks like it's mostly rust from the exhaust system. Actually, it doesn't look like any remnants of any mouse nests on this one. I'll need to order some parts before we run this anymore. If the fuel pump works, I'll be able to have this car run on its own. So hooking up my fuel bottle, let's dump fuel down through the pump to get it primed up. And then I'll crank the engine over a couple times and we'll see if it pumps the fuel back out or not. Okay, I'm just going to turn the engine over. We'll see if it pumps any fuel out. Did not appear to be working. It does have a manual lever on it. And pumping that, it looks like the pump is not working. Feels like it's stuck. So unfortunately, the fuel pump is not going to work, but I can hook up my IV back to supplying the carbs with fuel. 
and use it that way to drive it out of here. I doubt there's any fluid in it, but let's take a look inside the master cylinder. Yep, it's bone dry. It's not completely corroded and terrible in there. I think I'll put some fluid in it and see what happens. If we get lucky, the clutch and brakes will start working a little bit. Now that there's fluid in the master cylinder, I'm going to hit the clutch and brake pedals, see if they return. I'm gonna push the pedals down. If the pedals stick down, that means that the cylinder, oh yeah. I can't even push them down, so the cylinder is definitely stuck. There's no chance of having a working brake or clutch. I have the fuel bottle hooked up now, so I'm going to put it in first gear, try to drive it out of here. stuck because the throttle wasn't returning properly I had to use my foot to pull the pedal back you can see the tachometer is working now I think that was a big success today. Next time I'll try to finish up this car. And if you want to see more videos on this Sprite, remember to hit the subscribe button. Hey, I'm Steve from This With Cars, and here I am back with Barn Sprite number four. Where we left off last time, I got the engine running and I drove it around the parking lot a little bit, but it still does not have working brakes or a working clutch pedal. I've done a couple things since you've last seen this car. I put in the water temp and oil pressure gauge. I put in the little hose that goes from the heater valve to the heater core, and I also got a radiator cap. The goal for today is to try to get this car as drivable as possible and as complete as possible. So let's get started. To replace the master cylinders, I like to remove the entire pedal assembly. It's just a lot easier to do it that way. Once the pedal assembly is out, it's really easy to replace the master cylinder. Just two bolts hold the master cylinder in. And then the old master cylinder can just be tapped out. Looks like I have some bonus bolts in here. Sure, these were lost a very long time ago. So I'll just get this cleaned out. Putting the new master cylinder in is just a reverse of this process. Just set it in there. Make sure your push rods get into the ports and fasten it in with two bolts. I have the new master cylinder in. Now I can put the pedal assembly back into the car. I have the master cylinder mounted back in place and I have the brake lines hooked up. Before I put any fluid in it, I want to replace all of the hoses. This car uses a hard line all the way down to the clutch slave, so there is no hose for the clutch. But there are three hoses for the brakes, and I want to replace those now before I put any fluid in them. In the rear of the car is just one brake hose, and then it's hard line out to both of the wheels. This is the one part of the brakes that you can always guarantee that you should replace if your car's been sitting a long time. Even if the hose looks like it's in good condition, it's probably swollen up on the inside. And even though the master cylinder might have enough power to force brake fluid through the hose, because this is shut off, the fluid may not return back to the master cylinder, therefore locking up your brakes. 
So it doesn't matter, even if these hoses look in good shape, if you have an older car, if it's been sitting for a while, just due to age, you will need to replace these brake hoses quite often to keep your car in good condition. It's kind of weird, the last barn sprite that I did, uh, it looked wet up here as well. I don't know if the grease that might come out of the rear ends turns weird when it was sitting in the barn setting or what, but yeah, all the barn sprites have had wet grease right above the rear end here. That's kind of weird. It's nowhere else on the car. So I wonder if it's some kind of reaction with the differential fluid that it looks like this. Anyways, to easily remove the brake hose, I like to just cut it off. Now I can actually put a socket on here and spin it off really easily and I don't have to worry about stripping the nuts. So that I don't break the pipe right here, I'm going to wiggle this back and forth, make sure that it comes loose. I don't want to end up just rotating the nut and end up twisting the pipe and breaking it off. Now that it's nice and loose, I can unscrew it. Installing the new hose is the reverse of that process. You do have to spin this side in up here first because you cannot rotate this end if this end is fixed. So you do have to install this end into the T first. And when you're fitting this end, don't forget that you need to include a crush washer. Now I can move on to the front two hoses. To do the front brake hoses, I will have to take the wheels off. Here's the brake hose right here, just like in the rear. I'm going to cut it off. Now the replacement of this hose works the same way as it did in the rear. I'm gonna save my crush washer for later. I'm gonna wiggle the nut back and forth like before. Sometimes you have too much crud on these nuts that it's hard to get a wrench on there. So just grab a wire brush real quick. Get all that crud off of there. It'll save yourself a lot of headache. Just like on the rear brakes, you must install the short end first because this threads right into the wheel cylinder. You won't be able to spin the hose if you affix this side first. And don't forget your crush washer. Now I just need to repeat this process on the other side of the car. With the brake lines replaced, I've now put fluid in the master cylinder. I'm going to start by getting the clutch to work. So I need to go down by the slave cylinder, which is underneath the car next to the transmission. And I'm going to bleed all the air out of the line starting from there. Here we are underneath the car. This is the slave cylinder for the clutch right here. Now the bleeder is on the top of the slave cylinder. You can barely see it at the tip of my finger right there. So you can access that by reaching your hand up above the cylinder here, or there is an access hole right there and you can access that from inside the car. I usually find that it's easier to do it from underneath the car. I just barely cracked open the bleeder with my 7 16 wrench up there and already brake fluid is coming out of the bleeder so that's a good sign. That means that the brake fluid is coming down from the master cylinder and flowing down here. If you want to this technique is called gravity bleeding and if you leave your bleeder cracked open just a small amount it will just drain the fluid out, releasing all of the air from the system. This is not as foolproof as other ways of bleeding, but if you're the only one here and you don't have any other tools, this is one way that you can do it in a pinch. Now that I had the slave cylinder bled, I'm going to go inside, push the pedal, and we'll see if the piston moves in and out, disengaging the clutch.
okay, I think that was working. It first felt like it was maybe getting hung up. Okay, I just went back and looked at the video. What happened is the piston was pushed forward, but since it hasn't been moved in so long, it got stuck in the out position a little bit. And then as I applied more pressure, it pushed the piston a little bit more. And that a bit, little bit of movement was enough to free it, to allow it to retract. Once it had moved forward and back one time, it was then freed up and it has smooth, easy motion now in and out. So it looks like this slave cylinder is going to work. If I wanted to make it a little more reliable, I could take it off and put a cheap rebuild kit. They're only a couple dollars. So now that the clutch is working, let's move on to the brakes. The rear brakes on these cars are really nice because the bleeder is right here. It's facing back towards the back of the car. So here's the, this is the spring right here. So this nipple is actually facing towards the rear of the car, which makes it really easy to get to without even having to take the wheel off. One thing that I like to do before I start bleeding the brake is take the bleeder off. And with the bleeder off, want to make sure that it's actually open. Looking at it right now, it looks like it's clogged full of stuff. So if I were to try to bleed the brakes with this bleeder, nothing's going to come out. So I need to take this over to the wire wheel and take a small piece of wire like this, stick it up in there and try to clean out as much stuff from the middle of that bleeder as I possibly can. I have the bleeder cleaned up now. Two good ways of checking to see if it is cleared out. One is by blowing through it, seeing if the air comes out of the little port. And another way is by using a flashlight to see if that port is open. If the bleeder was clogged up, you would not see light from the flashlight coming in through that little hole. I'm gonna take all the other bleeders off the car, clean them up just like this. I have my vacuum bleeder hooked up to the bleeder valve. So we're gonna start sucking on it. We'll see if we can get brake fluid back here. Okay, I've run into a problem that's going to stop the work for right now. There's a puddle of brake fluid on the floor, but right beneath that is not one of the brake bleeders. I started bleeding the brakes and I hit the brake pedal to see if I was getting any pressure and I ended up blowing the brake line. So this is the brake line that runs to the left rear wheel. You can see the brake fluid leaking down the axle tube there. It's late at night right now and the parts stores are not open. So this is as far as I'm going to be able to go on the brakes for this time. I need to change the oil filter on this car for two reasons. One, because the oil filter is really old as is the oil. And two, because the filter housing is leaking. I think it's leaking around where the gasket on the top of the canister meets the oil filter housing. It just takes a 5 8 inch socket to remove this. So I'm going to loosen it and drop the canister down where I have access to the oil filter and the seals. Already I can see where my problem was. And you see the little bit of gasket right there. The O-ring that fits up into this groove right here was not set in correctly, and it was actually pinched right here. So I'm sure that the oil was just leaking out where the O-ring was not compressed properly above the canister. Another thing to make sure to check when you are replacing your oil filter, sometimes these O-rings can get jammed up in there and they don't appear that they're there. You may have thought that the previous owner might have left it out. And sometimes people will stack multiple O-rings up inside of here. And that's just going to cause it to leak. So make sure that you don't have any O-rings hiding up inside this groove. Make sure that you go in with a pick and pick out your old O-ring and check for any extra ones that might be up there. This one, I can just grab by hand, but you can see it's falling apart. So I'm going to need to grab a pick or a screwdriver or something to get into this groove and get this out of here. Now I'm gonna take my pick up there, make sure that there isn't any more rubber up there. Looks good, I can see the aluminum housing up inside this groove. So I know there isn't another O-ring hiding up in there. 
Here's my new oil filter. And I have a new O-ring to set up in there. I'm gonna try to put this in place before I set the canister up there. You want to be careful when you're putting that in that you don't get it twisted and that it's setting flat all the way around. Now I can put my canister back up. I've got it wiped off real good so I can check for leaks later. Once I start the engine up, I'll look down here, see if this is leaking anymore. But I'm pretty sure I've solved my problem. Well, that's as far as I'm going to go on Barn Sprite number four this time. If you want to see more videos on this car, click the subscribe button and you'll get notified when I upload another video. I'm Steve from This Week With Cars and today I'm back with Barn Sprite number four. Last time we left off, the engine is running but it's running only on the fuel bottle and the clutch works. The brakes do not work because we have a big brake leak in the rear. So it's time to get back on this car and see if we can get it drivable. This car needs a new fuel pump in order to run but the reason I didn't just throw a fuel pump on is because there is a gasket missing here between the body and the filler neck on the fuel tank. Here's what the gasket looks like. But in order to get this in, I'm gonna to have to drop the gas tank completely out of the car. So before I work on any of the rest of the fuel system, I'm gonna get this dropped and get this gasket put in. Removing the fuel tank is pretty easy. There's a fuel line right here that needs to be taken loose. And then there's six bolts along the flange of the fuel tank. And then you can drop it out through the trunk floor. That filler neck will just come through a hole that's above this fuel tank right now. So just give me a second and I'll have this out. The fuel tank is out. And there is one wire that goes to the fuel sender. The only way to get to this wire is to take the tank off. So be careful when you're dropping the tank that that is still going to be connected. Now I can squeeze this grommet in. Now when you put the gas tank back in, the filler neck will come up through this grommet, leaving the boot of the car nice and sealed up. While I have the tank out, I might as well take the fuel sender out, check it out and make sure it's working properly. It's just a few flat headed screws to take out and then that will come out of the tank. Wow, this is, the center looks surprisingly nice, especially considering what the outside of it looked like, but there's a good chance that this is still working. Obviously the float is in good shape, it's not rusted. Let's check this and the fuel gauge real quick and see if both of them work. I've ran two wires back to the back. This red one is hooked into the wire that was connected to the fuel sender. And this black one I have connected to ground on the car. I'm just gonna leave these setting right here, not connected to each other. Now I'll turn the key on. You can see my ignition is on now. The ignition light is on and the fuel gauge has gone over full. So I'll take my two leads. I'll take my black one and connect that to the casing of the fuel sender. Then I'll connect the red one where the wire on the fuel center connected before. Now if I raise and lower the float, the gauge should change accordingly. It may not be completely accurate right now. The length of the wires that I'm using is going to add a little bit of resistance there. But as you can see, it's working pretty well. So I don't see any problems with the system here at all. I'll just get this fuel center put back in with the fuel tank bolted back up, you can see the filler nut coming through the new grommet on the back. The cap just sits on the top of that. After I stuck the filler neck through the grommet, I put the cap on and that held the gas tank up and kept this filler neck from going back down through the grommet until I had, to, had the tank bolted back up. Now I need to remove the old fuel pump, which is located underneath the carbs way down here. There's no good way to film me doing this, so I'll get my hands in there and I'll get this out. Here's the old fuel pump. 
This right here on the side is a manual lever, so you pull this up and down to manually pump the fuel pump. You can use that to prime your carbs before you start your car. Let's take it over to the bench and test and see if this works or not. I have the pump cleaned up with the solvent. I have the intake right here. I'm gonna put that into the solvent and I'll pump it. And you can see the pump does work. Once I have everything hooked up, I may still have to put a hose on here and use a vacuum to pump the fuel up into the fuel pump to get it started. But I'll find out once I get it installed. Okay, I have the fuel pump installed again. This is the output from the fuel pump, and if it's working, well, you should see fuel coming out of here. So I'm going to crank the engine over. We'll see if it primes itself and gets the fuel flowing. Otherwise, I'm going to have to take a vacuum and suck it through the pump and up to here, and then the fuel pump should be able to take it from there. Doesn't look like the fuel pump is able to prime itself. So I'm gonna hook a vacuum up and suck fuel up through here. Here's the hose to my vacuum. I'm gonna turn that on and suck fuel up. And there we go, fuel's flowing now. I'll give it a couple of pumps manually, make sure that the pump is working. There we go, we can see it's pumping. Now I'll just get a new hose to connect from here up to the carburetors. Now I'll start the car, let it run for a little bit, and see if the pump keeps up. You can see the fuel pump's leaking. So the gasket that holds it together is no good. You can also see that the pump was working because this carburetor is leaking fuel out of it, so we know fuel was coming up here. But I think I'll just take that fuel pump off and put a new one on there so we don't have any more problems with it. Here's the new pump next to the old pump. These new ones do look like old ones, except that they don't come with the priming lever. That's a nice feature and one argument to keep rebuilding your old one and keep it running, but you need to weigh how much time are you going to waste always rebuilding and messing with the old 60 year old unit rather than just replacing it with a brand new one. So I'll just put this one in and we can move on. I have the new pump installed. Let's try this again. Sounds like the fuel's made on and up to the engine now. The fuel pump's not leaking. I think I'll move back on to fixing the brakes now. If you remember from the last video, I blew the brake line up here, this one right here. You can see it's all wet right there still. So I'll pull this off and we need to make a new line here. On the inside end of this line, it connects to this T intersection here on the rear end. This is the line that we need to remove. It looks like someone has replaced this before because the fitting should be, look like this. It should take a 7 16 wrench. This is obviously a smaller fitting, so someone has replaced this line before. The other end of the line connects to a banjo fitting at the wheel cylinder. So I'm going to remove that bolt on the banjo fitting. That way I can pull it out and then take the line off of the banjo fitting from outside of the car. So what you're looking at here is the original line which broke in half right here. This is where it was leaking. I have cut the line right here to get the fittings off of the ends. I'm going to reuse the fitting. So I did cut a little piece off of each end to get the fitting off. And then this is the banjo bolt that the fitting went into at the wheel cylinder. So I've already bent a new tube, roughly the shape of what the old one looked like. And I'll bend it exactly to fit once I get it in the car. But I wanted to get the length right and get the shape about right now I'll put my fittings on and take it over to the car. This is the tool that I prefer to use to make my flares. It is hydraulic, so it doesn't take a whole lot of pressure to use. Obviously, everybody's tool is going to be different, so I won't cover how this one works. Just remember that before you put your second flare on, that you must put the fittings onto the pipe 
Otherwise, there will be no way for you to get them on there. The new brake line is done. Now I can put it in the car. I have the new line installed. Now I just need to add brake fluid, bleed it, and see if I have any more leaks. I started to bleed the brakes and I heard some air popping up over here. So I need to tighten up these connections at this T connector here on the brakes. Hopefully tightening them will stop this leak. Brakes are bled and the fluid is topped off. Feels like the brakes work. There's one last thing I want to do right now, and that's fill the radiator with water. We'll see if the system's leaking or if it holds water and it seems okay. I have the radiator full of water right now. You can see the level right there. Doesn't seem to be leaking from anywhere, so I think the system is good enough for now. We'll put the cap back on. We're ready for some test drives. it for today we got barn sprite number four drivable and if you want to see more videos like this comment below and click subscribe i'm steve from this hook with cars and this is my 1960 austin healy sprite and this car is for sale right now on ebay this is one of six mark one sprites that i found here in a barn and i have been referring to this one as barn sprite number four so if you want to see previous work that i've done on this car go to my youtube channel and search for barn sprite number four I have also included a list of all the parts I put onto this car in the auction description. This is a great car and this would make a great project for someone, but this is a project. So whoever buys this car should go through every system, check everything. The car does run and drive so that you can load it onto a transporter. The generator is not charging at the moment and I have intentionally left it that way so that whoever buys this car knows that they are buying a project car and not something that they can drive home. I will make sure that the battery is fully charged so that you can transport it so it can be started and unloaded and loaded several times if it needed to be. So let's take a look around it. There's signs that this car has been repainted. I don't think that that red is the original color. It could possibly have been an iris blue car originally but it does appear to have red overspray in parts so uh, I'm sure that the car has been repainted. The car looks pretty nice. There's only a couple chips. You see one down on the rocker panel there. And there's a couple chips here on the back. Right there. But other than that, the paint job looks pretty alright. There's a little chip right there. You can see the wax. The white stuff there is just wax in the corners. There's a couple chips up here. There was a lot of bird droppings on it, so there's a little bit of splotchiness. You can barely see it, especially out here in the light. Those might be able to be polished out, I'm not sure. The convertible top looks in pretty decent shape. There is no tears in it, no holes. You can still see through the windows. The convertible top was up when it was stored, so it has not lost its shape. You can see it's still pliable. On the inside, the seat covers look in pretty decent shape. The door cards are there. You see the dashboard. This car does have a vintage Motorola radio. 
The odometer reads 72,799 miles. As with a lot of these cars, the light switch here, an ignition switch, it needs a new clamp to hold it tight. It does spin there, so you have to be careful when you're trying to turn it on because it wants to turn on the lights and the ignition at the same time. The black carpeting looks in decent shape. It does continue on to the back. That's a tonneau cover. It's a full tonneau cover, so that covers the entire cockpit when you have the top off. And you can unzip one side to leave just a driver's area uncovered for driving it if you don't have a passenger with you. The original convertible top frame looks in good shape. The tires on the car are the ones that were on it when I got it, so you will want to put on new tires before you try to drive it. But they are certainly good enough for transporting it across the country. The chrome on this car is in decent shape. It's not show quality, but it's a good driver quality. This car does look good enough that you could take it to car shows. Certainly not a Concorde car though. Let's take it for a drive. The car's been sitting here for a couple hours now, so this will be a cold start. I'm going to turn the ignition switch until I see the ignition light turn on. Make sure it's in neutral. I'm going to pull the choke out all the way and this car does have a mechanical fuel pump so we'll need to crank a little bit to fill up the fuel bowls and the carbs I put some fuel in, it reads three quarters now. Gonna go in a second, then in the first. Let's take a look under the bonnet. I did put a new battery in the car as well as new battery cables. A new water temp and oil pressure gauge had to be put in so you see the new sender for the water temp there. New radiator cap. Over here a new master cylinder for the brakes and the clutch. The front carb has a new Viton seal between the float bowl and the carb housing. And there's also a new fuel pump down there. All three brake hoses have been replaced. I think that's about it. This car was pretty complete when I got it. Underneath the car, you can see a slight amount of rust there on the front of the frame rail on the driver's side. Typical cave in there on that cross member from people jacking up the car from it. Oil pan looks in good shape. Typical British car leaks there. Someone has done some patches to the floors before. So this car could use new floors put in it. You see more patches over on this side. I think some of the old floor is above some of these sections of floor patches that they put in. Coming back further in the car, you see the fuel tank. 
I did have that fuel tank out and put a new grommet in it and checked the fuel sender. It was surprisingly clean inside there. You can see the rear brake hose there that's been replaced. We're on the other side. The exhaust is surprisingly intact. No big rust holes. Doesn't look the greatest, but there's no holes in it. I'm looking at the back of the car here. No big rust here in the back of the trunk like you sometimes find on these cars. There is some weird patches here. Looks like someone's done some brazing where the bumper mounts are. Maybe just on that one side. A little bit of rust right here. And on the other side, someone has put a little bit of Bondo there in that same position. In front of the wheels, again, little hole right there. On the other side, you can see a little mismatch from the patch that someone put on the floor. This is behind the front driver's wheel. There's a patch on the inner fender there. In front of the wheel, the bonnet looks good. Same condition on the passenger side. Behind the wheel, they have a little patch there, just like on the driver's side. And I'm sure that these floor patches were done a long time ago. It's pretty crude compared to what you would do today. But they did a good job of not making any of that visible on the outside of the car. Here's a look looking down the passenger side rocker panel and the driver's side rocker panel. Here's the underside of the front bonnet. Doesn't look like there's been any front end damage to this car. A lot of times these can be pretty wrinkled up. There it goes. The bug eye number four is off to England. Thank <laughs> you.